sorry we are a little slow in getting started today. Uh, that doesn't take away from the exciting talk we're going to hear from our keynote speaker. Uh, we have, uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm Anil Kripalani, uh, the president of the Thai San Diego chapter. Uh, we are part of the uh, global Thai ecosystem uh, with uh, the purpose behind Thai being fostering entrepreneurship. It's a nonprofit, largest nonprofit in the world, uh, focused on entrepreneurship. And we've got some coverage in The Economist magazine uh, earlier last year and uh, uh, sponsorship globally by the Kauffman Foundation, if you've heard of that organization that uh, helps uh, promote entrepreneurship. The latest chapter in the ecosystem of 55 chapters around the world for Thai is Orange County. And just prior to that, uh, Brussels, Belgium. Uh, again, the chapters uh, com are, are composed of individuals. This is uh, primarily volunteers, uh, people with some standing in the industry, uh, new startup company entrepreneurs that come together for networking, for exchanging ideas, for learning for the, the new startups, learning from the stalwarts how to go about raising money, how to write the right business plan, you know, getting going. Dai has been in existence 17 years, and this chapter has been around for 10. We're going to celebrate our 10th anniversary. Uh, in June. Among us are a few charter members, the stalwarts I mentioned. Uh, these are invited to be charter members, people uh, present today. Uh, we have about 35 such in our chapter, uh, individuals, uh, people who are present here, charter members, uh, Professor Vijay Gurbakshani of UC Irvine, Dinu Sen, uh, who is a uh, CEO of a pharma company, uh, research uh, and uh, I guess products, and uh, Deepu John of iSherpa, the VC, uh, Sanjeev Thand, who is from Foley Lardner, one of our sponsors. Uh, Sanjeev, you can see him there. Um, he's a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> Patrick Berry. Uh, Patrick, can you just stand up for a minute? Um, and why I call on Patrick to stand up is, uh, besides the fact that he's a Navy SEAL, he is... <laughs> was. Uh, and he served in Iraq uh, uh, as well. Um, besides that, he is my successor. Uh, when I hand over the reins, we have a, a soft handoff, uh, as, we, uh, as the wireless people call it, um, in, uh, in August of this year. So Patrick will be the sixth president. We, we do very smooth transitions. Um, and then Rahul Chaturvedi, a brand new charter member from Novotel Wireless. And I saw Ahmed Guri here. Ahmed, uh, very nice to see you. Um, I, I apologize. SafeMed is the name of the company, but I think I know you have a new name. Avita. Avita. And Vita. And Vita. And Vita. I'm not able to hear exactly, so I apologize for uh, the uh, pronunciation. Um, and we have among us uh, a couple of our spons uh, representatives of our sponsors, which of course we are very happy to have your sponsorship. And if this session with Frank evokes uh, some additional sp uh, sponsors, we would be very happy. Um, and by the way, Frank, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I just mentioned that Orange County just got going, so uh, they are right by uh, in, in your neighborhood. Okay, uh, our uh, sponsors uh, Foley, we have I think Sam Hoffman here, I believe. Thank you. Thank you again for multiple years. And Guy Jones from Cosmic Bridge, thank you for being here and uh, supporting us. Uh, our other sponsors include Qualcomm and Advanced Trustee Strategies. Uh, we appreciate uh, the help they give us. So, um, 
let me also mention um, that, um, because we won't have a chance to say that at the end, uh, that uh, our next event in February, we do these events once a month, um, and our next event in February is uh, a keynote uh, speech by the president and CEO of GenPro, uh, Carl Hull, he's the CEO, uh, very well known in the pharma uh, biotech industry, and uh, he will be talking about opportunities and challenges in growing a sustainable molecular diagnostic business. So I hope, uh, even though many here might be interested in software and gaming, uh, if you are an entrepreneur or would-be entrepreneur, uh, sometimes it, uh, it helps. Come listen to how different industries, the CEOs who have made it, uh, like we, we, we will hear from Frank, what, uh, what makes it, what happens, and how they've gone through the journey. So we have today uh, a special, normally we, uh, with keynotes, we go straight to the keynote. Today, this is, this is something special I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, we have with us uh, Danny Kittishian, who chairs UC San Diego's Entrepreneur Challenge Competition. And he wants to tell us just uh, a couple of minutes uh, on um, a, a special competition. Uh, why don't you come on up, Danny? Thank you very much, Neil. Um, How's everyone doing yeah. tonight? Good. good, good, good to hear that. Everyone's getting full. Uh, my name is Danny Katishian, and I represent the, the USA Science and Engineering Festival. This is going to be the first ever festival of its kind. It's going to take place nationally. Um, many of you are here from the San Diego entrepreneur community. Y'all might be familiar with the San Diego Science Festival that we put on last year, our nonprofit. Larry Bach, our executive director, ran that. Um, Lockheed Martin, our biggest backer, uh, last year's festival came to us and uh, they challenged us. They said, y'all did such a great great thing here in San Diego, we want you to take this national. So they gave us half a million dollars and they said, here you go, <laughs> make it national. So what I'd like to do is just get y'all, the members of the entrepreneur community, to at least disseminate this information to your organizations. We've already got over 300 professional science engineering organizations. We've got the top research institutes um, in the world working with us, top universities, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, UCSD, UC Irvine, um, and any of, probably your universities already covered. Um, IEEE, all the different associations, uh, American Society of Engineers, uh, Chemical Engineers, uh, Mechanical Engineers, and we've got government institutes involved, DARPA, NASA, Department of Energy, Depar Department of Defense, um, so what we're doing is we're hosting a festival on the on National Mall. So where could we have picked a better place to create a celebration for the K through 12 population and also get national uh, recognition? So what we want to do is create a culture in this country uh, celebrating science and engineering. So many kids here today and in the audience, um, if you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, and we, we, we have a few here, um, they'll probably tell you about cultural figures or icons that they're, they're looking at today, but they're not looking up to the, to the scientists and engineers. So we have a lot of Nobel Prize winners going out to the schools, having lunch with the kids, telling them about discoveries that they found. We had uh, Dr. Venter do this here in San Diego, um, the father of the human genome, go out and discuss why it's important to study DNA and, and the such. But um, we'd like y'all to get this information out. If any of you are interested in getting involved, we'll be in Washington, D.C. the 23rd and 24th. Um, we have a lot of sponsors, mainly most of our sponsors are from the San Diego community um, because Larry Bach, our executive director, has founded many companies here or seek funded many of them around here. So if you'd like to get involved and you're not already involved or if you, uh, if you want to set up a booth to, to have hands-on activities, we're going to have virtual reality environments simulated for, uh, for children. We're going to have flight simulators there and anything all the way down to building DNA molecules out of toothpicks and marshmallows. So um, lots of fun. That's what we're expecting to do. We're expecting over a million to, to, to participate. We had over 200,000 participate this past year in the San Diego Science Festival. So we believe we're going to be able to do it. Uh, President Obama has invited our executive director twice to the White House already to discuss this, uh, this matter. And he's made it part of the National Science Initiative that he's pushing forward. So uh, we are a separate nonprofit. So if you don't like President Obama, uh, <laughs> I've had a few of those. Um, we're not affiliated to the president in his office. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, if it turned political, I was going to cut it off. <laughs> We are all about entrepreneurship. Uh, I neglected to mention.
mentioned that uh, after um, Karl Hall next uh, month, uh, in March, we will have Professor Marshall Goldsmith, uh, who is uh, on the Global Thinkers. He's a local professor, very hard to get. It's taken us uh, a year to get him. So I hope you will come back and listen to him talk about Mojo, his new book. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator, introducer, uh, Peter Frischak. He's probably going to tell you about uh, our keynote speaker. But if I may add, Frank and I sit uh, are, are UCLA alums. So hopefully you'll, you'll give UCLA a, a plug in there somewhere. Um, I don't know if that would help. Anyway, Peter, uh, like all software developers, uh, did uh, they should document better. He gave me the shortest bio, so I'm just going to read what he gave me. Um, Peter uh, of uh, Pixel Active Incorporated, um, a maker of city and terrain building tools for the game development and simulation industry. Uh, Peter, I think that may not do you justice, but I'll hand off to you. <laughs> Before I start, I want to thank Gary here of Drive Canada, uh, who jury rigged something very beautiful <laughs> that will enable us to hear sound for the presentation. So, thank you. Um, Frank, I'm, I'm not going to do a, a long introduction, but I will say um, our topic here is corporate culture. Um, if we sum up the shared values, customs, and traditions of a company, um, we use that phrase corporate culture. It's what employees and customers learn to expect. Most of us here dream about the kind of success that our speaker and his company have created. Starting with three friends in 1991, Blizzard developed celebrated games in a wide variety of genres and has grown to over 1,000 employees. Their highly successful World of Warcraft has more than 11 million subscribers globally and brings in over a hundred million dollars in revenue each month. The premise of this evening is that shared values and a clear mission are central to that success. We look forward to learning more. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Frank Rizzo. Thank you. Uh, I'm not accustomed to giving 45 minute presentations, so I have a lot of notes. Uh, the other thing I didn't do is write any clever jokes to keep you guys entertained. Uh, so what I did is I brought some uh, videos that are eye candy. Uh, they are representative of the standard of quality that we have at Blizzard, but uh, beyond that, hopefully they're just interesting to watch. <laughs>
So that uh, is a promotional video. That trailer, we put that trailer together for uh, an event that we host uh, called the Worldwide Invitational. It's, a, it's an eSport event um, where we uh, are promoting uh, gaming as a competitive professional sport. Um, and in Korea, professional gaming is a national pastime. There are television channels dedicated to broadcasting just StarCraft matches 24-7. It's, it's amazing. And so uh, when we announced StarCraft II, we put this trailer together. We hosted Worldwide Invitational in Seoul and unveiled that trailer uh, during the opening ceremony of that event. Um, these uh, pre-rendered, non-interactive CG sequences, um, there's something that you can contract with a studio to put together on your behalf, but we actually have a department internally, it's our cinematics department, and their responsibility is creating these uh, CG sequences for all our games. Um, we are committed to the total experience for our games, and as part of that, you know, this is a, a key component, so we feel it's really important that uh, we do that internally. So, uh, I'm Frank Pierce. Uh, I'm the Executive Vice President of Product Development and Co-Founder at Blizzard Entertainment. Um, currently, my role is on the Product Development side. Uh, we have four development teams that are working on, on games right now, and two of them are responsible to me. Um, we also have the Cinematics Department that I mentioned also responsible to me. We have some other internal services groups that are also uh, involved in game development that I, that I help oversee. Um, I received my bachelor's degree in computer science and engineering from UCLA back in 1990. Uh, while I was there, I was fortunate enough to meet someone named Alan Adham. Uh, Alan knew when he was at school that when he graduated, he wanted to make games. Um, he had some contacts in the industry. Um, I graduated about six months before him. Uh, I went to work in aerospace. This was 1990. There was still an aerospace industry in Southern California. Um, <laughs> And uh, the following holiday season, I knew Alan was graduating, and I happened to give him a call just to say hello. And he was very excited to hear from me, and we got together that week, and he invited me to come with him to start a company to make games. Um, I knew nothing about making games. Uh, Alan was a very motivational person, and didn't let that discourage me from joining him. Uh, I've been at Blizzard for almost 20 years now, Today, I'll try to talk about the culture that's evolved at Blizzard over the last 19 years, uh, the experiences that we've dealt with. Um, the one disclaimer I want to make is that I don't feel like Blizzard Entertainment is by any means a subject matter expert on culture. Um, we've, I've had the opportunity to uh, visit companies like Google. Uh, there's a company in Las Vegas called Zappos. I don't know how many of you have heard of them. Um, they are by far, they, they, they are subject matter experts on the, in the area of culture, corporate culture. And so we've, we've got a lot of experiences. I don't want to try to tell anyone how they should do anything or what is appropriate for corporate culture. All I want to do is relate the experiences that we've had in the last 19 years. So, uh, Blizzard history. Uh, we were incorporated in, as, a, as a company called Silicon and Synapse in February of 1991. <laughs> Um, as you know, clearly we're focused on uh, the entertainment experience in online PC games. Hopefully you've all heard of World of Warcraft. Um, if not, I'm not offended. Um, so, but when we started, uh, we were very fortunate. The industry allowed us to start on a, a shoestring budget, $10,000, $5,000 loan from Alan Adham's parents, a $5,000 loan from a third co-founder's parents. His name's Mike Morheim. Uh, they brought their two PCs from home in. Uh, we built a few desks from the office supply store. We had about 600 square feet. Um, Alan had a contact at a company in Irvine called Interplay Productions. At the time, they were making PC games on the DOS platform. And uh, he knew Inter uh, Interplay's president, Brian Fargo. And Alan was able to secure contracts with Brian to do conversions of their DOS products to other platforms. So Brian wanted some of his DOS games on the um, Commodore Amiga. Brian wanted some of his games on the, the Macintosh. And so we got modest contracts to convert DOS games to those other platforms. And it was actually very ideal for us.
because as I mentioned, I didn't know anything about computer games, and Mike, the other co-founder, didn't either. Alan had some experience, but very little. And so with these conversions, we actually had the opportunity to look at code that was authored for a game and make the conversion to these other platforms without knowing anything about computer games. And it was a great opportunity for us to learn. And then as we worked on that, we had the opportunity to create some original Super Nintendo titles. And the scope of a Super Nintendo title in 1992 was much smaller than the scope of a title for the PS3 or the Xbox 360 today. And so we were able to do it uh, with very small teams. We didn't need a lot of game designers. We had some programmers. We had some artists and a lot of ambition and a lot of drive and a lot of time at the office. Uh, there's no substitute for hard work. So, uh, let's see. Uh, in 1994, we were acquired by an educational software company called Davidson Associates. Uh, very fortunate for us, it gave us the opportunity to actually start developing our own games. Uh, we decided we were going to make a PC game. At the time, we were playing a game called uh, Dune. Dune 2, which was a RTS game on the PC, and we felt like, hey, this is a really fun experience. If we can make this in a, a setting that's pa we, that we're passionate about, other people will hopefully be passionate about it as well. Uh, our background is kids. We played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. I might be speaking Greek to a lot of you. I apologize. Uh, but we felt like if we could make it in a fantasy setting, it would have a lot of appeal. We also felt like playing against a computer AI, while it was fun, uh, was not as interesting and compelling as playing against a human opponent. So we actually had uh, the in implemented an option for play over a serial cable. Um, so even before our first Warcraft game, which was on the, on the PC, we were still doing multiplayer on the SNES. So our foundation is in multiplayer gaming, and it dates back all the way to 1992. Um, when I go through this history, one, one of the things that, that I want to emphasize is that all of our successes are built on our previous successes. Uh, I know that people see World of Warcraft and they hear 11 million subscribers and they hear $100 million of revenue per month and they see dollar signs and they want to chase that. And what people sometimes don't recognize is that we didn't just go out and make World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft launched in uh, 2004, and that was 10 years after we launched the first Warcraft game. So we spent 10 years making Warcraft 1, making Warcraft 2, making Warcraft 3, making some expansion sets for those products, and building the intellectual property of Warcraft, and building a fan base, fan base around the Warcraft franchise. We also spent time, in 1996, we published a game called Diablo, and that was the first game that we published on our Battle.net platform. And our Battle.net platform is an online service for matchmaking and, and online gameplay, chat rooms and, and the such that are, that are real time. Um, so everything that we've done throughout our history was building on our previous su successes and learning and become, becoming as much as possible an expert in an area and then building on that for the next product. So like when in 1998 we published StarCraft and that launched uh, eSport in Korea, it also really brought to light to us the fact that we were not just making games for the North American gaming community, we were making games for a global community. So with StarCraft, we learned a lot about be, being a global company and publishing products for a global, a global community. Um, let's see. Uh, in 2003, our headcount was only 300. Uh, I think in, you may have mentioned our headcount was 1,000. That's our, our headcount in Irvine is about 1,100. Our global headcount today is about uh, 4,000. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. So we, in, so as I mentioned, in 2004, we published World of Warcraft. Um, that was the first time we had to open global offices. Um, so we had opened offices outside of Paris and in Seoul, Korea, so that we could support the product directly there. Uh, we've released a couple expansion sets for a while since, uh, grown the, grown the, the fan base. When we originally launched, I'll probably talk about this later. Um, when we originally launched World of Warcraft, we had infrastructure in North America for to support about uh, 400,000 players. Uh, and that was our capacity plan for the first 12 months. And within the first month, we had exceeded that capacity. We actually stopped selling copies of the game at retail outlets 
because we could not support the capacity. And so until we were able to get additional infrastructure in place, we weren't able to sell more copies of the game. That's a high class problem, by the way. <laughs> This is all stuff you've probably heard before. Okay, so in the beginning, uh, I mentioned we had very little industry experience. Uh, funny thing, most of the people that we hired at the time had a little industry experience. When we started hiring artists, um, some of the artists that we hired for, to work on our games, not only did they not have industry experience, they didn't even know how to use computers. So we not only had to train them about the industry, but we also had to train them how to use computers. But these were guys that had a lot of talent. Um, one, one of our senior art directors today, he's been there for probably 18 years. Um, when we hired him, he was uh, taking tickets at the movie theater in Orange. Um, and he's uh, extremely talented. Uh, like one of the things that we looked for was uh, people that had a real passion for gaming and a real drive and, and a good work ethic. Um, another guy that we hired, uh, at the time we hired him to be an artist, he was working uh, in the back storeroom at the local Toys R Us. So, but what was really great is that, um, you know, we didn't have product, projects that required huge teams. Um, the, the ports that I talked about, the, the SNES titles, these were, these were projects that only required a small handful of people. The, the number of people working on some of these projects, you can count on one hand. And from a culture perspective, that's, that's really easy to deal with because if you put five people in a room together, the cu culture uh, grows very organically. Um, so that's what I'm talking about here, these Super Nintendo titles and Mega Ports. Um, culture is much, e trust me, cu culture is much easier to deal with when you're small. Uh, when you're talking about entrepreneurship, uh, it's, um, a, a, it's a situation that I would describe as delightful compared to the culture of situations that you deal with with 4,000 people worldwide. <laughs> um, you know, we were able to go out for meals with the entire company. So a lot of big companies, they host Christmas parties. Uh, back in the beginning for us, when we hosted a Christmas party, we all got in the car and we drove down to a local restaurant and we had a meal together and that was our company Christmas party. Um, but uh, like I said, we looked for people that had a real passion for gaming because we really felt like the, the way to create the best games was to look for people that wanted to play great games. And if they wanted to play great games, they would be really passionate about making great games. And that's part of where our commitment to a really high standard of quality has come from. And, um, you know, that's something that I, I feel like our expectations internally as a corporation are probably much higher than even our fans, although from the outside looking in, they may not think that, but trust me, it's true. Um, we beat ourselves up much more than our fans do. Um, as I mentioned, when, when you've got a really small organization, uh, or culture and communication is very organic. Um, you know, we didn't even have a, a network at the time. We, we, artists delivered artwork that was being created to the programmers via floppy disk. Um, so people were walking into each other's offices and communicating with each other. It was very easy to, uh, to tell someone what you, what you needed. Um, onboarding is something that is a, is a term that we're using at Blizzard these days, and there was no such thing as onboarding back in the day for us. Um, someone came in that was new, and they were exposed to the entire organization, the entire, entire culture of the organization, just by eating lunch in the office with everyone else. Um, but uh, one, one thing that we've always held true then and today, um, we never want to sacrifice long-term gain for short-term benefit. All the decisions that we make, we want to think about the long-term, about you know what, what is the right decision for the long-term. We don't want to chase numbers for the quarter or numbers from the year. Um, we've always, since 1994, when we were acquired, we've always faced pressure from our uh, parent corporation to hit certain numbers, ship products under certain timelines. Um, we, we tell them no. Um, you know, we've got, a, we've got a track record that justifies what we're doing and uh, justifies our success. Uh, so, uh, anyway, back in the day we had few, if any, formal procedures uh, revolving around culture and the small size really allowed our culture to just be organic and it was, it was all very unspoken. Everything that, that new people learned when they were coming in, it wasn't because we told it to them explicitly, it was because they saw what we were doing day in and day out to meet our goals, 
to, to meet our standard of quality, to, to make sure that we were delivering what our fans expected of, uh, of us. Um, World of Warcraft then, this would be World of Warcraft like 2004 or five years ago. Um, this was a small team at the, by today's standards at the time, the 60 developers that were working on World of Warcraft full time, day in, day out, was a huge team for Blizzard Entertainment. Um, it was comprised of, of veteran Blizzard developers. We actually, um, the, the team that seeded the World of Warcraft team uh, split off from the development team that created StarCraft. We split the StarCraft team into two teams. Um, this is another one of those things where we built on our previous successes up until that point. We only ever had one development team working on products. And so when the StarCraft team finished, we split it into two teams. The uh, core of the StarCraft team began working on a product called Warcraft 3. And then the other group that broke out to see this other team actually didn't start working on World of Warcraft at the time. What they started working on was a squad-based role-playing game with a working title, Nomad. Um, but this, this group of guys was actually struggling to find their stride with this project. Um, a lot of the guys on that team were playing other MMOs at the time. They were playing games called Ultima Online and EverQuest, which you guys from the games industry that play games will be familiar with that stuff. Everyone else is still Greek. Um, my apologies. You can ask the people shaking their head after. Um, anyway, they were playing MMOs, and they were very passionate about MMOs, and they, they were finding their stride with, with Nomad. And so we, we all took a step back, and, and we said, hey, is this Nomad, you know, squad-based RPG really the game that we want to make? And the answer that they came up with was no. Uh, after playing all these other MMOs, they really felt like they could improve the MMO experience. They really felt like the Warcraft universe would lend itself really well to an MMO, and they decided they wanted to make uh, World of Warcraft, and they started making World of Warcraft. And what's key here is that the process by which this development team determined the project that they were going to work on was not from some ivory tower of executive leadership. Right? This was something that they decided in conjunction with, with executive leadership, but really decided for themselves. For us, if we want really great games, the development team that's going to make those games has to be committed to making that game, has to really want to make that game. So they play a very, very active role in determining the product that they're going to work on. They don't have the final say. It's a collaborative effort with the company leadership and the development team, but the results that that we see by allowing them to play an active role in determining the game that they're going to make uh, are, are evidenced in, in our track record. Um, anyway, the, the stuff that rolled down the, the right side there uh, was the credits for the development team for World of Warcraft in 2004. Just remember what that looked like. Uh, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the World of Warcraft team looks like today. Uh, I've got a few org charts, hopefully that won't offend anyone, not too dry. Um, but uh, remember when I talked about earlier, we didn't have a lot of experience in the industry. Well, this is the leadership structure for the World of Warcraft development team. This is just the leadership structure for the World of Warcraft development team, and this group of people has a combined industry experience of 128 years. Uh, we didn't even have 128 days of experience when we started. Um, we have several tiers of leadership. Uh, we have really about 30 managers total within the World of Warcraft team, but this is really the core leadership group uh, for the team. Uh, when you're making a computer game, you've got four disciplines, that, at least at Blizzard, we've got four disciplines that we're dealing with. We've got uh, engineers, programmers, uh, we've got artists, we've got designers, and we've got uh, what we call production, which some industries uh, it would be similar to project management. Um, one thing I'm going to mention as it relates to these organizational charts is that we don't have a predefined structure that we have to apply to any one development team. We 
form the structure that we use within any given development team around the people and the leadership people of that team. We don't try to put the people into a structure. We're not trying to put square pegs into a round hole. We look at the shape of the peg in terms of the people that we have, and then we create a hole for that peg based on those people. And it's, it's because you're not, we don't always find the right people for the roles that we want to fill, so we have to adapt, and regardless of how many employees we have, we still have to be flexible about what we're going to do with our leadership structure. Um, one other thing that you'll note is that there's a game director role and a production director role, and all those uh, bubbles underneath it all have lines that go into those two bubbles, and that's a dual reporting, uh, which I know is maybe not very common either, but it's, there's a balance when we're making games and we have to balance the, the great quality of the, the gameplay experience with the goal of actually finishing the game and getting it into the hands of our fans. And so that dual reporting structure is representative of the partnership that we need between production and vision to actually achieve that. Um, so this is the org chart for our art team on, on the World of Warcraft team. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I've got all sorts of notes here, but uh, it probably won't be anything all that interesting for you guys. If we have extra time and you guys want, I can always come back to this. Um, but <laughs> no? oh. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I would note uh, on this slide, though, and it's true for the other departments, in the, in the team as well, is that these managers, the art director, these lead artists in the different disciplines, these are guys that were and or are developers. These aren't people with a foundation in managing departments. These are guys or girls in a, in, with a foundation in creating content, um, which presents certain unique challenges. But we really feel like to be able to properly direct the guys that are creating content, we need people that understand that very, very well. Um, and we have uh, handled that in a, in a way that I'll talk about in a subsequent slide. Um, the design team, again, you'll notice that this chart doesn't look all that similar to the chart I just showed you. And that goes back to what I said about uh, putting a structure based in, based on the people that you have, not a structure that you desire. Um, one of the things I would say about our design philosophy for World of Warcraft and for all our games is that um, we have a very iterative approach to what we do. Um, no one, none of the designers are going to document a game system and hand it off to the engineers to implement and call it a day. It takes time to experiment with implementations of systems and implementations of you know, story sequences or whatever it is. And so we're not afraid to iterate and sometimes it takes longer and sometimes we don't hit deadlines as a result. But to hit the, the quality bar that we want to hit, we have to try it out, we have to experiment with it and sometimes we have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, programming team. I'm sure I have some clever note here about that. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned, there's about 30, 30 lead, leads slash managers within the World of Warcraft team. And as I mentioned, these are content creators, not people with a foundation in, in leadership or management. And so one of the things that we try to do is limit the number of direct reports that any of these people might have. So we've found that uh, a small number of people on a focused team works very well. Um, five is, is pretty ideal. Um, sometimes we have groups as big as eight people. Um, it's not always ideal, but uh, you know it also depends on the leadership capabilities of the developers. So how do we deal with these developers that are also leading? Um, I mentioned the producers that we work with, and I mentioned that they're similar to project managers but um, these are guys that will assist the team leads with task tracking, task assignment, 
management, logistical needs. Um, we have production teams that run across all the department projects. Um, we've got a rule of thumb in terms of trying to determine how many producers we might need for a development team. And we, so the ratio that we find is successful is about one producer for every 10 to 15 developers. Some of that depends on the, the capability of the producers. It depends on the self-sufficiency of some of these uh, sub-teams. Um, one important distinction, it may not mean a lot to people that aren't within the games industry, but if, if any of you have worked in the games industry, uh, it's not uncommon for uh, developers to actually report to producers. The producers at Blizzard are not direct managers of the developers. Um, it's just not how we do it. Um, that doesn't mean that they aren't someone that the producer, that the leads can rely on. Um, the producers act as a peer. They can help the, the art director or the sub leads with any of the, the people challenges that they face. And believe me, when you've got a team this big, there's plenty of people challenges. Um, but they're not the boss. Um, but they can assist with performance management, personnel challenge. Um, basically, our production team is like an auxiliary management team for all these leaders that don't have a foundation in management and leadership. Uh, I'm gonna show you guys another video so you don't fall asleep. was the uh, introductory sequence for the, the first World Warcraft expansion. Um, that expansion took us almost two years to put together. Um, I'm always amazed um, because the biggest challenge that, one of the biggest challenges that we face, we face many big challenges, but one of the biggest challenges we face, particularly on the World of Warcraft team, is that we have so many developers on the team that are so passionate about the experience they play the game themselves. They're very, very creative. We have uh, a, a 
huge backlog of amazing ideas. And so one of the big challenges that we face is controlling scope of the features and content that we actually put into a patch or an expansion set. So we want to get all this great stuff into the hands of our fans, but we always want to get so much great stuff into the hands of our fans that we don't know when to stop, we don't know when to say no, we don't know when we've reached a point of diminishing returns, and so a big challenge for the leadership is to recognize that point of diminishing return and try to keep everyone in check because they want to put so much cool stuff into the game. Uh, that's what you call a high class problem too. <laughs> when we run out of ideas, then we'll have some, some serious challenges. Um, we have seven offices around the globe, uh, Irvine, Austin, Cork, uh, Velocity, which is outside Paris, Seoul, uh, Shanghai, Taipei. Uh, I don't have a lot of comments on this slide. The, the international offices handle uh, market research and communicate back to us uh, local market conditions, uh, keep us apprised of new games that are coming out in the region, uh, help us with censorship and government approval, particularly in China, uh, which is a whole unique set of challenges in and of itself. Um, regional marketing, regional PR. Um, in Taipei and Shanghai, we operate World of Warcraft through a partner, um, not necessarily by choice, it's one of those government approval things. Um, so those offices there also liaise with our uh, partners in those regions. Um, we have customer service for each region in the region. Um, so all North American customer support is handled out of North America, European customer support out of Europe, etc. cetera. Um, but the key thing to note here is that we've, we want to create and maintain a blizzard culture for our, for our company, for our organization. And we have to overlay that on top of all these regional cultures. Um, and with the, the Cork and Velazy offices, it's an even bigger challenge because uh, at one point, because we host customer service for uh, multiple languages out of a single office in France, we at one time we had 28 different nationalities represented with our employees in the Velazy office. So we've got the Blizzard culture layered on top of the, the culture in France, layered on top of all these cultures that were brought in from all over Europe, and uh, it's a unique challenge. Not one that we don't enjoy, though. Uh, okay, Blizzard today. Um, throughout our growth, we've always tried to maintain uh, the <coughs> philosophies and values that have brought us success. Um, this is, I don't know what you would call this slide, a PR slide. Um, these are the results of those efforts. Um, we've had a pretty good track record. Uh, as I mentioned, we have over 4,000 employees worldwide, seven, seven offices around the globe. Um, now, our executive leadership team, instead of having no experience, we average 15 years of experience in the industry. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the online experience and the high level of quality are really what we hang our hats on. Um, so about two years ago, just over two years ago, uh, we were at University Research Park in, near UCI, and uh, we had our employees spread across uh, four different buildings, three in University Research Park, and then another building that was probably four miles from there. Um, we were very fortunate, uh, Broadcom, relocated to University Research Park and vacated a campus uh, in Irvine of about 280,000 square feet. And we leased that and we spent a lot of time working with the Irvine company um, because when we toured it, when it was a Broadcom facility, uh, it was what I would describe as very sterile. Lots of long hallways, lots of white walls, offices on the exterior, labs on the interior, and I think that works fine for engineers, but not so great for creative artistic folks that are used to creating some of the stuff that I showed in the videos. Um, we spent a lot of time working with uh, the, the Irvine company to redesign that facility. 
um, uh, creating a floor plan that was more dynamic and not so homogenous with color on the walls and color on the floor and different types of office space, whether it's bullpens or shared offices. Um, the, the campus has uh, a basketball court, it has a volleyball court, we have a gym, we have, uh, there's a locker room with showers in the gym area, uh, there's a subsidized cafeteria, uh, there's a, we have a small museum off the lobby, we have a small theater that seats about 55 people, we can use that for just about anything we want. Uh, one of the more useful things that we use it for are bringing in guest speakers um, so that uh, we can expose our developers to different ideas, uh, developmental opportunities. Um, one thing that I would say, um, because this campus houses a lot of different departments, and for us, it's really important that we recognize what our business is and own that business and do it ourselves. Um, I get emails periodically from unsolicited from people that want us to outsource our software development offshore. And it's just not something that we're gonna do. We're making entertainment software that's part of our core business. We have to own it. Um, so, you know, we have high level of attention to detail to all aspects of the game experience. So, as I mentioned, we have the cinematics department, but there's a whole plethora of other departments housed on this facility that are critical to that. We have our own marketing department. We have our own public relations department. This might not sound like a big deal for a company with 4,000 employees, but part of the reason we have 4,000 employees is because we do so much of this ourselves. In 1994, when we were acquired by Davidson and Associates, we were just a development studio. We didn't have any of these functions. We didn't have our own quality assurance department. Um, we got our own quality assurance department as a result of a snafu. Warcraft 1, we licensed it to another publisher to publish in France. Um, copy protection on Warcraft 1 was open your manual to page X. What is word Y on line Z? And they didn't do, they translated the manual into the foreign language, but they didn't translate the backend copy protection. So the game couldn't be installed. Unbelievably. And we thought, how is this possible? Did no one check this? And apparently not. Uh, and so we decided at that point, hey, we might need our own quality assurance department because clearly other groups aren't holding themselves to the same standard of quality that we hold ourselves to. Um, we have a community management team that's responsible for interacting with our fan base. Um, we have an events management team. We host an event on a pseudo annual basis called BlizzCon. It's a, a huge fan festival. Um, and, and we operate that, that whole experience ourselves. Um, because being in direct contact with our fans is core to our business. We can't afford to let anyone else do that for us. Um, we have customer service, we own that ourselves, we don't outsource that with the exception of allowing our partners in China to operate customer service because it's required. Um, localization, I mentioned uh, the snafu with that, we do that ourselves as well. Um, WoW is available, um, when I say WoW, I'm talking about World of Warcraft, is available in, in 10 different languages and we manage the localization of that ourselves. We might contract out some of the translation, but the assembly of the translated build, the quality assurance of that, customer service for that language is all handled internally. Um, our network services department that handles the entire hardware infrastructure for WoW and you know, over 11 million subscribers is all managed internally. Um, we actually have a global network operations center in our facility uh, where they're monitoring our infrastructure around the globe. They have uh, their, we have uh, satellite TV and they monitor the weather at all the regions of our data centers. Um, when, shortly before the World of Warcraft launched, um, we had, uh, we were running a beta of the, of the game and we had servers in a data center on the East Coast. And a hurricane came through uh, the East Coast and came up the coast and uh, the severe weather generated some tornadoes. And as luck would have it, one of these tornadoes actually damaged the data center that our servers were in. 
So we were very fortunate that that happened when we were in beta and not when we were in commercial operation. We learned a valuable lesson and uh, monitor weather now. Um, we have an online technologies department that's responsible for implementation of our Battle.net platform that I managed, um, or I, that I mentioned. We manage our own web presence. We've implemented our own customer support tools. We've implemented our own uh, billing technologies. Um, as I mentioned, we like to uh, provide learning and development opportunities for our employees. Uh, we have a, a learning and organizational development department devoted to uh, serving that cause. Um, we give every department, whether it's a development team or some of these other groups that I've mentioned, a lot of flexibility at the department level to determine what kind of events they want to host for themselves, whether it's to build, uh, you know, team building, uh, social experiences, interacting with other teams, uh, whatever it is, they have, they have a budget that's earmarked for that. They don't have to get permission from anyone as long as they're not drinking too much. <laughs> um, we, uh, I'll go over our, some of our, of our values that we've, we've explicitly defined later, but um, we operate an, uh, an employee opinion survey on a pseudo annual basis because we want to hear from our employees. We want to understand what it is that we're doing well, what it is that we're doing poorly, and where we need to really focus our energies, where we would get the most bang for the buck in terms of addressing their concerns. Um, I would say that uh, in terms of compensation for our developers, uh, we're probably one of the best in the industry as far as total cash comp goes. Uh, we get data from something called a Kroner survey. I don't know, I get this, this information from HR. Um, and we can look at how we pay our developers in terms of what percentile in the Kroner survey. Um, in terms of base salary, we try to stay competitive, but we have a profit sharing plan that's based around the, the mantra that if Blizzard is successful, we want our developers that work so hard to be successful. And when you take the profit sharing and you look at total cash comp for our developers, they're making multiples of the 100th percentile in terms of total cash comp. Um, and there's a reason for this, right? I mean, Blizzard Entertainment is built on the efforts and talents and creativity of our people. Our people are by far our most valuable resource, and we need to do, you know, what we what what's right in terms of making sure that they can stay focused on, you know, using that creativity to, to create great games. Um, we do service awards. How many people work at a company where they've received a service award for tenure? Not too many. What did you get? <laughs> Really, that's not bad. That's pretty good. Um, I worked at, at in aerospace, as I mentioned, and I think I saw someone get a lapel pin for for their service. Um, we for for two years of service, we give our employees a, a ceramic stein that's based with on content and artwork from our franchises. At five years of service, we give our employees a sword to hang on the wall. <laughs> uh, at, at 10 years of service, we give our employees a shield so that the older guys can fend off the attacks <laughs> of the guys with the swords. Uh, at 15 years, uh, we, we give our employees a, a gold ring. Um, I can show anyone that wants to see it, my, my 15 year service award. Um, and uh, no one's reached 20 years yet, but we're still debating what's appropriate for 20 years. The horse? Um, an epic mount, yes, that, is, that was mentioned. Um, I don't know that uh, we will be able to agree on what qualifies as an epic mount, although I'm sure it will be Italian. Um, so, the one thing to note is that five years ago, Blizzard Entertainment had 500 employees, and most of those were hired in the year leading up to that to support the launch of World of Warcraft. So six years ago, we had a few hundred employees. And we always had more old employees as compared to new hires. And what that meant is that the, the existing employees could preserve the culture of Blizzard 
through their day-to-day -day activities because it was established and the new hires come in and they see what we're doing. So similar to what we were talking about in an earlier slide when we were very, very small, even with a few hundred people, because we weren't hiring at a very fast rate, we were still able to preserve our culture without explicitly defining what that meant. But in the last five years, we went from 500 people to 4,000 people. And so now, over time, the number of new people has outnumbered old people by uh, a multiple of, you know, seven, whatever it is. And so what did we do? We're like, you know, I mean, this is a challenge for us. How do we preserve our culture with all these new people bringing in their own ideas, bringing in their own values, bringing in their own expectations? So um, I attended uh, a program at UCLA one spring called the Technical Management Program. I don't know if you've attended it or not, but it's a, a, a five-day program where you get to attend classes, four classes per day. It's almost like going back to high school. I find it to be very, it was, it was a diversion from my day-to-day -day life. It was, it was very interesting. And one of the instructors there, I took a strategic planning course. And I walked away from that course and said to myself, wow, uh, we don't do this at Blizzard. <laughs> Maybe we should. And I went back and I talked to my boss, uh, Mike, and I said, hey, we don't exercise for us. I'd like to contract with our, the instructor that I had to come in and do this course for the 30 senior most leaders of the company. You know, we can look at it, we can evaluate it, we can use it piecemeal, we can discard it all together. We, there's no obligation on our part. But I think it's, it's, it's an interesting perspective on a way to do things that we don't really think about because we're so busy fighting fires day to day, we don't necessarily think about what's going on next year or what's going on three years from now, except to the extent that the bean counters have to provide a budget and budget planning and annual operating plan to our corporate umbrella. And so uh, Terry Schmidt was our instructor, and he came in, and uh, his model is very simple. It's about deciding where you want to go. It's deciding about uh, how you'll know when you get where you want to go, determining where you are right now, and deciding how you're going to get where you want to go. But part of the where you want to go is, you know, who are you as an organization? And so he asked us, what's your mission statement? What are your corporate values? And we all sort of looked around at each other and we didn't have a concrete answer, although we all sort of knew the underlying philosophies and principles that had gotten us to where we were. And it was really fortuitous for us because we had gone through all this growth and we didn't have these things. And Terry uh, sort of, I, I, I looked at it at the time as, as a diversion from what we were, what we were there for. But in reality, he facilitated helping us define where we want to go as an organization. And so what he did is he facilitated the process by which we de determined a mission statement and the process by which we determined our core corporate values. Um, a lot of the people, because we are such a casual culture of creative people, were concerned that the idea of a mission statement and corporate values would be too corporate. Um, we worked very hard with the leadership. We also put it all in draft form, and we distributed it in draft form to the entire organization to solicit feedback on these things. And surprisingly, the, the corporate stigma did not hang over it. Um, and so this is the mission statement that we ended up defining for ourselves. Uh, dedicated, Blizzard Entertainment is dedicated to creating the most epic entertainment experiences ever. Um, big debate on whether or not we were creating epic games or epic entertainment experiences. Um, but when we originally created the, the name Blizzard Entertainment, we specifically chose entertainment because we knew that someday we wanted to see the franchises that we were creating leveraged for more than just computer games. Um, you know, we've put our heart and soul in this intellectual property and hope to see uh, a feature length film for example, and we're actually, that's something we're working on with, with a production company called Legendary Pictures, a, a Warcraft film. They'll do most of the work, but um, it's still our intellectual property, and we want the Blizzard Entertainment label to hang proudly on that. And so 
uh, we were able to settle on entertainment experiences as compared to games. But uh, that did require from uh, our vice president of game design the concession that our first value would be gameplay first. <laughs> <laughs> so that we didn't forget our roots. Um, so, uh, the one thing I would say about the mission statement is that it's, it's very difficult, like you can go through the exercise of defining a mission statement and through that process Terry exposed us to a lot of mission statements and now I'm, you know, kind of uh, on alert to see mission statements and I see mission statements and they're novels and like I've seen them on I don't have my, my employee badge, but I've seen mission statements printed on the back of an employee's badge. And I'll ask that employee, hey, do you know what your mission statement is? And they'll say, no. <laughs> and it's like, okay. And then I look at it and they don't know it because it's a novel. So we tried to create something that, that, would, that would, people would be able to remember that would represent who we are. But just in case, um, rather than printing it on the back of everyone's badge, we actually cast it in bronze. Um, and put it under a 12-foot statue of an orc on a wolf that sits in our courtyard at our campus. So if anyone can't remember it, they can always walk outside to the courtyard and read it in Bronx. Um, because we have a very iterative philosophy, uh, not just on game design, but in everything that we do, the Bronx plaque is only screwed into the mount. Uh, and we that off and it if we need to. Um, so the... <laughs> The other thing that we did was we defined our core values. Um, gameplay first, because we hang our hat on a great gameplay experience. Um, learn and grow, uh, because we want our employees to invest in themselves, improve in any way that they can. Uh, this is actually something that we defined as important, but we're actually still struggling to actually figure out how to best support. Uh, commit to quality because we have a very high quality bar for ourselves and we know that our fans do uh, think globally. Um, mm -hmm. Another story, uh, the Sam Didier, who is the senior art director that I mentioned that was taking tickets at the local movie theater, uh, at one point when we were working on one of the Warcraft games, drew uh, a bipedal panda type creature. And now, uh, I don't know how many of you know much about pandas, but they're from China. Um, Sam put this Pandaren creature in Japanese samurai garb and we had a lot of fans in China and they didn't like that and it was an interesting experience for us but I also think it was an interesting experience for our fans in China because they provided their thoughts on the subject and we actually responded, which might not be common in China for them. Um, we actually changed it so that it was in more traditional Chinese garb. Uh, so that was our lesson in, in thinking globally, because we are a global company. Sometimes we get uh, myopic and only think about the North American uh, market, because that's where we are, that's what we live and know on a day-to-day -day basis. But uh, only about um, a third or less of our market is actually in North America. Most of it is internationally. Um, embrace your inner geek. Uh, for us, you know, as, as gamers, and we're also fans of all sorts of uh, science fiction and fantasy media, and those are our roots. I mentioned Dungeons and Dragons earlier. Um, we don't want anyone that works at Blizzard to forget our roots and what, what inspires us and what motivates us to contribute to this space. Um, so we want everyone to remember that. Um, we responsibly, with World of Warcraft and over 11 million subscribers, there's a lot of issues that, that the industry hasn't really discovered yet and we really feel like it's important for us to you know, lead from the front. Uh, one of the things that we're dealing with is how do you deal with uh, privacy issues for minors when you're talking about online experiences. Um, we want to make sure that we're taking a responsible stance in, in whatever it is that we do. Um, every voice matters. Uh, that ties into um, the employee opinion survey that I mentioned, but we really want our employees to feel like they have a forum to express their creativity as well as expressing their concerns, but it also applies to, uh, to us in terms of it's you know, listening, right? I mean, it's about us as leaders 
and us as, as developers listening to what people have to say so that we are serving our fans appropriately. And to be candid with this, there's blurbs that describe each of these values up on our internal intranet, um, but it's also important that everyone that works there has their own concept of what these mean to them. Um, play nice, play fair is one of my favorites. Um, I know it's also one of my boss's favorites because it's about integrity, it's about um, doing what's right. You know, when you're dealing with your coworkers, when you're dealing with your boss, when we're dealing with potential partners, when we're dealing with our fans, and when our fans are dealing with each other. Um, right, because we're playing games, but it's important that we all are playing on a level playing field. So, um, you know, uh, I mentioned the bronze plaque for the mission statement. Uh, lest anyone forget these, uh, we put a bronze ring flush in the concrete around the statue and put these eight values in bronze around that statue as well. Um, but uh, we feel like we did a decent job creating uh, a manageable list of values that, that people could remember and would resonate with them. Um, and again, the plaques with the values only screwed in in case we need to change any of them. <laughs> Although we are limited to eight. Uh, so anyway, the other thing I would mention about the mission statement and the values is that this is something that's relatively new to us. I think we put these in place, I think we were working on this just about maybe two, two and a half years ago, and having gone through that exercise just over two years ago, it's still something that we're trying to figure out in terms of consistently evangelizing and defining these values with our existing employees as well as with new people. So that is the punctuation on my thoughts on culture. Now, when I mentioned that I was going to come speak, uh, they asked me to uh, speak to interactive entertainment opportunities today because this is an entrepreneurship uh, group. And so, you know, I think that opportunities are many, and opportunities are what you make of them. But what I did is I put opportunities on this slide that I think are particularly exciting. And the reason I list the iPhone and mobile devices, casual games on social networks, Xbox Live Arcade, because these don't require the investment of tens of millions of dollars to make a compelling entertainment experience. Um, I mentioned everyone seeing dollar signs when they hear about 11 million subscribers and $100 million in revenue per month. Well, guess what? That doesn't come cheap. Uh, you know, we've got thousands of people devoted to the World of Warcraft experience and, you know, almost two decades worth of experience that we've built it on. If someone wants to get a start in the interactive entertainment field, I don't recommend trying to uh, get tens of million dollars in venture capital and build a huge team and try to create an experience that will rival World of Warcraft because it's a huge undertaking. We have all this experience that we learned over the years and we still have failures on a daily basis. Um, so with, with opportunities like this, again, the industry has sort of come full circle to when I first entered the industry where you can create a game with just a handful of people that you can count on one hand. Um, these credits right here are credits I pulled off the internet for a game called Geometry Wars. It's only uh, you know, less than a couple dozen people that created a game called Geometry Wars for Xbox Live Arcade, and it was uh, very popular. There's uh, all sorts of opportunities that can be had with smaller groups if you have the right drive and the right passion. Uh, let's see. And also, you don't have to deal with the cultural challenge of an organization of hundreds of people, uh, the cultural challenges uh, of only a handful of people are much, much easier to deal with. So, uh, that is what I wanted to talk to you guys about. I've got one last video to wake you up before we do a Q&A. How am I doing on time? Perfect on time.
I will do my best to answer your questions, although I can't guarantee answers to all your questions. I would just ask that uh, you would repeat the questions so that everyone could hear. Got it. Go. Uh, the question, basically you talked about some of the challenges of, you know, you guys tried to basically embrace some of the more traditional corporate values of like, let's call it the, the baby boomer model. And you have a very big model that's based on generation X and generation Y. So as a lot of these baby boomer type of companies are trying to adhere to this younger generation, can you give them any insight on how you made that a success, success story working with a, a, you know, a firm that's dominated by generation X and generation Y? So just like the execution and, and deployment of corporate values? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, you, you, come from a, uh, you come from a model that's based on a very young generation and most of the, the firms that were around are based off of a, a baby boomer type of model that's trying to transition into a generation or gener uh, X or Y type of model. Can you kind of comment on how you made that kind of community work for your, for your firm? Uh, I would say that first and foremost we view our member ourselves as members of that community and so we're making games for ourselves first and foremost. We're making products and experiences for ourselves first and foremost. Um, we view ourselves as our own target market. We don't go out and try to do, you know, focus groups and focus testing, all sorts of weird stuff like that. Um, the development teams are their own focus group. The employees are their own focus group. Um, we, I think we've, you know, uh, very much so built a company with those people in it. I don't know if that answers the question. You've seen the other MMOs come and go in terms of decline and all that. How do you sort of like, um, you know, kill your own? How do you create like new things out of the group that you have given the huge success you have? How do you sort of create the next thing based on on knowing that, you know, it's not a static world that things have to, be, you know, that things have eclipsed other MMOs and you want to basically be the next MMO? Uh, real fast, Peter, is everyone able to hear the question or do you still want me to repeat it? This is fine. It's fine? Yeah. Do you guys want me to repeat the question or it's fine? Okay. Um, that's a really good question. And uh, we have a department that's responsible for the story and lore at Blizzard. And the MMO experience is very different from the traditional products that we release to our fans. Um, and it was actually a question that came up, like how do we have this sort of constantly evolving experience in the context of an intellectual property that we might at some point want to publish another game in someday. And we just decided, screw it, we'll do it anyway. Um, so, you know, in terms of like what's next for us, um, we've talked a lot about, you know, do we create a product that cannibalizes our own customer base from World of Warcraft because World of Warcraft is so successful both in terms of critical acclaim and the expectation of our fans and financially um, and it's a discussion that we've had and you know some of some my, my view and I think it's shared by some of some of my colleagues is that if anyone is going to cannibalize the World of Warcraft players uh, better us than someone else and so um, you know like in in Korea uh, there's a, a fair number of World of Warcraft players, and later this year, we're going to be launching StarCraft II in Korea. And our expectation is that StarCraft II will be somewhat of a cultural phenomenon there because the original StarCraft was and is still a big part of, of the gaming experience, especially in game rooms. Um, yeah, the PC bombs. And so, uh, yeah, it's it's... We fully expect StarCraft II to cannibalize the World of Warcraft player base in Korea, and you know what? Better us than someone else. And even if they're not paying us the same that they would pay for StarCraft II that they're paying for World of Warcraft, at least they're still our customers. And our customer base and the community that we're trying to build uh, online is really what's most important. And it's one of those uh, long-term decisions versus short-term decision, right? Yes, StarCraft II may cannibalize World of Warcraft, but in the long term, that's the best thing for us is to maintain our community as best as possible. 
What about uh, the cyber cities of Hyderabad and Bangalore? I mean, is India figuring in your, you know, I know they don't have uh, powerful PCs distributed around the country, but. We, we have um, a global operations and business development department that's responsible for evaluating uh, potential growth markets that we can launch World of Warcraft into. Uh, India is definitely on that list. Uh, Japan is on that list. Uh, Brazil is on that list. There's definitely a lot of opportunities out there. Um, the big challenge for us as it relates to World of Warcraft and, and these potential other international regions is that um, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking to launch World of Warcraft in a, in a new language, in a new region. Um, oh, I did a, a presentation with a, with a colleague of mine in Austin back in September. And, uh, a little bit of the content in this was based, was based on that. And uh, one of the slides talked about localization. And uh, we punctuated every slide with big, overwhelming numbers. And I think the number for the localization slide, I want to say, was um, 3.2 million words would need to be translated for any new language that we decide we want to support. And localization of that language from start to finish uh, we estimate it will take 18 months. So it's a huge uh, investment on our part because the World of Warcraft content has been developed over the course of the last 10 years, right? The game's been out for five years, but we were in development for five years prior to the launch. So we've got 10 years of development and 10 years of content that need to be localized for any new region that we want to go into. So we're always looking at them, but it, there's a lot of considerations that go into it. Yeah, in India has got English, so yeah. you don't have to. But I understand entertainment can be in different languages, even in India. Um, uh, what about piracy and copying and all that? Well, so with World of Warcraft, uh, we've got quite a luxury for ourselves because the only way you can play the game and get the full experience is to connect to our server. To connect to our server, you have to have uh, an account with Blizzard and log into our servers through our authentication uh, servers. So we've been very fortunate in that um, we don't have a lot of piracy with World of Warcraft. There are people that have tried to host uh, World of Warcraft servers, but they don't have, it doesn't have the same social element to it. A really important element of the World of Warcraft experience is the social aspect. And on a, a pirated World of Warcraft server, you don't have thousands of people and that's probably not necessarily where your friends are playing and the the, the rogue server uh, trails the content experience by several patches because when we release a content update they may not have all that content or anything like that so um, it's definitely been an issue for us in the past uh, one of our products Diablo 2 um, we were very fortunate I think we sold uh, 70,000 copies of Diablo 2 in China but um, our market research showed that there were 7 million Diablo II players in China. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a big challenge. Uh, so you had your hand up back here. So, you talked about sorry, e sport in Korea. Do you, like, given the real e sport landscape in Europe and North America for all of PC and now console games, are you, I mean, I know World of Warcraft competitively has skyrocketed in the last few years, so where do you see your community and you guys? I know you're not building games for that, but it makes a huge impact on the popularity of the game. It really does. It's something that's really important to us. We actually, I mentioned our community, uh, uh, community management department and a subgroup within our community management department is a group of guys that are dedicated to eSport. Um, so their responsibility is to support third-party organizations that are doing eSports stuff, but also we host our own tournaments as well. Um, you know, I mentioned BlizzCon. We host tournaments at BlizzCon with, with cash prizes for the winners uh, in the, the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, yeah, we, we aren't really making games explicitly for eSport, but we do want to, as much as possible, facilitate eSport with the games that we make. Um, one of our mantras that I didn't mention through the whole presentation is the idea that we want our games to be uh, easy to learn but difficult to master, similar to the concept for chess, right? I mean, 
chess, the rules for chess, not too difficult. You can probably teach someone the rules of chess and how to play it in a matter of 30 minutes, but they could spend a lifetime trying to master it. Um, and so we try to get that, that curve, that learning curve into our games so that someone can sit down and play it and enjoy it. But if you want to devote yourself to being the best at the experience, that level of complexity is there. How do we avoid taking the fun out of making computer games? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, since 1994, we've always been a wholly owned subsidiary, so we've never had to deal with venture capitalists. Um, but we've always had to deal with a corporate parent. Um, it, when Davidson & Associates acquired us, we were very, very fortunate. Uh, Davidson & Associates was operated by uh, Bob and Jen Davidson, and Bob was exceptionally uh, trusting in what we were trying to achieve and left us to do what we wanted to do, and we've gone through a number of corporate changes at that level uh, in the last 15 years, and it's 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 always it's just something we we accept and, and have to deal with. Um, we basically have a layer of executive management, and and I don't even fall into that category. Uh, our our CEO and our COO and our VP of finance are basically the guys that are tasked with sheltering the development teams from that portion of the business, and so. Those are the guys that, that talk to our corporate umbrella, and when, and when we, we need to push back on something, the developers, they don't even hear about it. Uh, the developers are left to make games, and uh, hopefully they don't see too many comments of our uh, apparent CEO being misquoted. <laughs> Wow, I would say that neither of those is a very easy question. <laughs> um, gold farming, uh, we have a, I can't remember the name of the department, but we have an internal department that is uh, constantly trying to deal with that issue. Um, we close down accounts that we uh, strongly believe to be partaking in RMT activities on a weekly basis. It's a constant battle. Um, it's not unlike uh, dealing with hackers or dealing with uh, denial of service attacks or anything else um, we're by global standards and the number of people playing our game and the number of people trying to do unscrupulous things to our game uh, we are always outnumbered um, so we work very hard and do the best we can with it but we'll always be outnumbered um, you know we've got uh, uh, we've developed a lot of technology to try and help us with that um, but you know, it's something that we'll probably be dealing with in perpetuity for a while unless we decide we want to sell gold ourselves, which I don't think we're going to do um, because the game really wasn't conceived around that concept. Uh, another question was how the process by which we decide the products we're going to make. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's really about the development team and what they want to do. So when a development team uh, becomes available, which candidly is not very often because we don't have that many development teams. Our development cycles are much longer than probably the average development cycle in the industry. Um, but with that, when that team comes free, the leadership of that team talks about what they want to do. They talk with their team about what they want to do. Um, we never get 100% consensus on what a development team is actually going to do, um, but we the leadership of the organization partner with the leadership of the development team and look at what they want to do and we don't go out and do a bunch of market research. Um, we look at the game that we want to make and we want to play and maybe it's the game we want to play because we think we can do it better than someone else that's done it or maybe it's the game that we want to play because no one else has made it yet or, or whatever it is but it's, it's, very, it's a very organic process that involves uh, just uh, a lot of interaction and communication between the team leadership and the uh, company leadership. Does that answer your question or you? Okay. Last question. I have a question about your, how you test the organic nature of the game. Like, how do you know that you're going to get this game that you want? 
Uh, well, we have we have diff several different layers of iterating on the experience to to deal with any potential problems. And so, uh, initially, the development team that's making the game is the only group of people that are actually playing the game, and. The, the guys on our development teams have a pretty high standard of quality and they're going to find and fix a lot of the issues with the game um, before the, the game actually leaves this, the scope of their responsibility. Um, the next step, we have a, a quality assurance department and that's several hundred people based in our facility in Irvine and their responsibility is to you know, scrutinize the game for bugs, Exploits, weird problems, all sorts of border cases, and they'll spend uh, they'll spend potentially years uh, with with the build between the time they get their the first version of the game and the time we actually press the build onto a disc for replication. But even before we press the build on a disc for replication, we'll typically uh, operate a public beta test with our fan community. So um, we'll press a preliminary version or distribute it electronically these days and distribute it to uh, some subset of our community that's really passionate about playing preliminary versions while those problems may still exist and actually finding those problems and reporting them back to us. So for World of Warcraft, we actually hosted an open beta where anyone that wanted to download and, and test the game for us was able to do that. Thank you, Wasn't that wonderful? Uh, I had heard him before, and that was at Royce Hall in UCLA, and this was just absolutely delightful. Thank you, and uh, 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 you can speak for longer, and I, we would all love it. Um, I was watching people's faces here, and uh, there's a lot of interest in what you've done and what you've achieved. Uh, please accept a small token on uh, behalf of Ty San Diego to thank you for spending the time with us. Should I open it? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, it's just a small token. Um, again, uh, while uh, um, while he is doing that, <laughs> okay. we are is this from Tiffany. Uh, <laughs> we are a nonprofit. <laughs> I think our charter members would have a good uh, Yes, thank you. you no, know, I'm, I'm particularly thrilled because, uh, again, we sit on the same computer science board. Uh, we've always been in uh, just separate meetings. I'm, this is my first chance to really. Uh, get to know Frank, and uh, again, thank you. Uh, I must thank our host, uh, Peter Frieschak. He uh, was the one who organized this, and uh, Peter, thank you again. Uh, for those of you who enjoyed this and are not DI uh, members, uh, I hope you will come back and join and give us ideas for similar wonderful uh, keynotes and panel discussions. Uh, for those who are members, uh, please uh, continue to give us ideas and, and showing up and uh, helping this be a vibrant chapter. Um, uh, I remind you again that next time we alternate um, not precisely, but between biotech events, uh, software events, uh, wireless uh, technology related events, and now uh, last time smart devices which will connect everything, uh, including gaming, will come into play. And uh, I know we had the uh, DriveCam uh, uh, executive here. Uh, it'll connect telematics to smart homes, to games, entertainment, whatever else. Uh, so there are new entrepreneurial opportunities and Dai across the ecosystem intends to get in there with entrepreneurs that are interested and VCs like uh, some here who will help fund it. Um, so with that, uh, just one reminder that the next time we have uh, Jen Pro CEO, uh, please come and listen. Uh, it's, a, it's a star company, local, and uh, 
Following that, uh, the management guru, Marshall Goldsmith, uh, if you haven't heard of him, uh, look him up and you'll find uh, he's, I think, in the uh, top 15 uh, of the uh, top business thinkers in the world. Uh, we happen to have uh, two such uh, exalted uh, business thinkers, leaders, amongst us here in this chapter, and Marshall uh, is going to talk about uh, something he titled Mojo. Uh, so come listen. Again, thank you for attending. Uh, appreciate your coming. Thank you.